Dechendrolma always starts her day by burning mulberry twigs. She does this to pray for her family's future. Dechendrolma lives in the village of Gelsong in Shannan Prefecture, Tibet. A farmer and Buddhist, on special occasions she walks 15 kilometers to Yumbalakang Palace. She believes that performing the traditional prayer wheel turning ceremony here will bring her family a bumper harvest, happiness and good health. Dechendrolma is 61. For the first four years of her life, she was a serf. In 1958, when she was four, Detien Droma appeared in a documentary film. She and her family were living on the Kelsong Memorial Estate at the time. Prior to 1959, 95% of Tibet's population were serfs or slaves. The remaining 5% were the upper class, belonging to either of three categories. Government officials, nobles and high-ranking lamas. Tibet was a society of feudal serfdom under theocratic rule in which religion and government were inseparable. The government protected the religious institutions, and the religious institutions controlled the government. Uh, système ce qu'on appelle féodal, c'est-à-dire ce qu'on appelle moyenâgeux. La terre n'appartient pas euh, aux paysans, elle appartient aux seigneurs et que, effectivement, chaque agriculteur euh, doit payer euh, par son travail euh, et euh, voilà, donc du coup, il n'a pas, pas d'indépendance. Throughout human history, slavery and serfdom have existed in many parts of the world. But by the mid-17th century, new trends of thought and the Enlightenment began ushering in the concepts of individual rights, freedom and equality. Slavery and serfdom, now regarded as backward, were outlawed in many countries. By the end of the 19th century, the abolitionist movement had brought about the final end of slavery and serfdom worldwide. But not in Tibet, where the system of feudal serfdom persisted well into the 1950s. Under this system, supreme authority rested with the Dalai Lama. Next to him in power was the regent, and then came the head of the Kashag, or governing council. Xizang. 平均海拔在四千米以上的这么一个青藏高原地区吧，它相对来说还是比较封闭的。这样的话，它的制度的稳定性就有了一个外部的环境。With the Himalayas defining its southern border, Tibet has been an inseparable part of China since ancient times. It's unlike anywhere else in the world, with its mountainous terrain, unique customs and lifestyle, and powerful religious climate. Its landscapes are among the most striking on Earth. Yet the beauty of the scenery belies Tibet's dark past.
Prior to 1959, Dechen Droma and other farmers in the village were landless serfs. They were tied to the Kelsong Memorial Estate, where they worked. This is the site of the old Kelsong Manor. The building has been destroyed, but not the memory of it in Dechen Droma's mind. Manorial estates were the organizational hubs of Tibet's feudal society. They first appeared in the 10th century, and by the 13th century, they had become the key links in a comprehensive system of serfdom. It was a system that, back then, basically met the needs of social development. Melvin Goldstein, in his book, A History of Modern Tibet, points out, manorial estates were hereditary and, as in Europe, the main source of wealth. They consisted of arable land and a bound labor force of serfs obligated to farm it. The well-preserved Pala Manor offers a glimpse into life in Tibet's feudal society. Norbu Tsering was born here in 1945. His father was a Pala. One of the leading families in Tibet, the Palas can trace their history here back 400 years. At the time of Norbu Tsering's birth, the Palas were among the 12 richest families in Tibet. They owned 37 manors across the region along with 1,050 hectares of arable land, 12 areas of pasture, 14,000 head of livestock, and more than 3,000 serfs. On the far side of the road is the place where the estate's serfs lived. Prior to 1959, serfs were divided into three groups namely Trapa, Doichin, and Nanzan. At the bottom end of the scale, the Nanzan were little better off than slaves. Tabsang's family lived in the village of Zengba, on the lower reaches of the Yarlung Zangbo River. As Trapas, they farmed land which was rented from the local estate owner. At the age of 12, Tabsang was sent to work in the fields. <laughs> Using the most basic farming tools, they were unable to produce much from the land. Their five mu, or a third of a hectare, yielded only about 500 kilos of grain a year. Their income, though meager, was still subjected to numerous taxes. Shingagpoti 
The scene shows a serf paying capitation or personal tax. A popular saying went that you were taxed from cradle to grave. Among the 200 forms of taxation enforced in Tibet at the time, there was birth tax, capitation tax, a tax on joining a temple to train as a lama, a tax for being imprisoned, and even a tax on burying the dead. Tabsang's family, unable to make ends meet, were forced to borrow from the estate owner. In 1953, 91-year-old Alexandra David Neal published her book, Le Vieux Tibet Face à la Chine Nouvelle. In it, the veteran French traveler and writer offered an eyewitness account of the living conditions of ordinary Tibetans like Dab Sang. Because she dressed in Tibetan clothing and spoke the language fluently, people opened up to the French woman. They described their misery and the heavy burden imposed upon them in the form of exorbitant taxes and corvi. David Neal explained that all the farmers she met were lifelong serfs, most of them heavily in debt. With no alternative other than to borrow money, grain and livestock from the local estate owner, they were forced to accept extremely high interest rates, which could at least double the principal. Borrowed money incurred a monthly interest rate of 10%. As David Neal explained it, Tabsang and his family would have been regarded as talking tools. Two thirds of their time was spent performing korvi, or free labor, for the estate owner. David Neal wrote that all hard labor, including road building and housing construction, was done by the impoverished farmers. But they were not paid and not even given any food. Deprived of all freedom, they grew poorer with each passing year. Tibet didn't have any uh, real development since uh, centuries, and uh, even I must say that uh, there was no there was no economic growth. There was even uh, the population even uh, shrank. Yeah, Tibet was very very backward. The uh. system avant 1959, c'est un système très très feudal, et effectivement avec euh, des problématiques sociales, économiques euh, dramatiques pour la population locale. The fact was, the negative and destructive impact of the system of serfdom on Tibet's development had been evident since the mid-19th century. By the 1950s when, after several centuries, the system of feudal serfdom would finally be ended, the imbalance in wealth within Tibetan society was extreme. 
The surf owners and rich elite, who accounted for less than 5% of the population, owned virtually all the arable land, pasture, forests, mountains, rivers, and livestock. The family of the 14th Dalai Lama himself owned 27 manors, 30 areas of pasture, and 6,000 serfs. The 95% of the population who were serfs were living in a state of abject misery. The Dalai Lama alone counted among his possessions 8,000 kilograms of gold, 5 million kilograms of silver, 20,000 pieces of jewelry, and more than 10,000 items of expensive silk and fur clothing. In the Kelsong Village Museum, there's a small room where the serfs' living conditions are recreated. The data reveal the following. In the mid-17th century, when the Sokang family established their manorial estate here, there were 80 farming households and the population was 606. By the mid-20th century, there were just 59 households and 302 people. In the course of 300 years, the heavy corvi, land tax, and other levies had caused this radical reduction in the population. Norbu Tsering was born at a time when the Pala Manor was thriving. His father, Pala Tasha Wang Chu, was a shrewd estate manager, dedicated to increasing the family's wealth. However, he was becoming increasingly concerned by the attitude of the estate's serfs. Nono 一个社会的话，它的生产能力、创造社会的能力或者更新社会的能力都是非常非常低的。再加上就西藏那个制度上的约束，贵族本人也无能为力。There were 197 hereditary noble families in Tibet at the time. The leading seven or eight families each owned dozens of manorial estates and thousands of hectares of land. They were extremely careful about guarding the considerable wealth they generated, to the extent that nothing was invested in the development of Tibetan society at large. Pala Tasha Wang Chu, through the shrewd management of his estate for 10 years, succeeded in building up his family's fortune. All he used it for was to make his manor house even more magnificent. By 1947, two years after the birth of Norbu Tsering, his father had completed the redevelopment of Palamana. Yet, within a few years, the family would be forced to abandon it. These photographs were taken by Spencer Chapman, a British journalist who visited Tibet in 1936. Following his trip, he wrote a book, Lhasa, the Holy City. Tibet, as Chapman saw it, was a holy feudal society. He described the great show of obsequiousness put on by all in the presence of those in the highest positions. Traders, middlemen, and even headmen would stand with heads bowed, nodding in unison as an order was given. 
To stick out the tongue was a mark of respect, as was a sharp intake of breath, since this would remove pollution from the air the nobleman was breathing. While receiving an order, a servant would continually say, Lales, meaning, yes sir, in a high-pitched sobbing voice, while at the same time sucking in his breath. Such scenes, as described by Chapman, were testimony to the strict hierarchical divisions in society. Tibetans were divided into three strata, with each stratum in turn divided into three classes, and determined by a person's ancestry. Depending on which of the nine classes a person belonged to, so the value of their life was measured accordingly. The highest person would be worth his or her weight in gold, and by contrast, the life of the lowest members of society was considered to have no more value than a piece of straw rope. Serin Hamo was born a serf. Like her ancestors, she belonged to the lowest class in Tibetan society. She owned no property or personal freedom. At the age of six, she was sent out to work. The only bright spot in her life was the love of her family. But then, one day, in 1938, 12-year-old Tseren Hamu was told she was being sent to another manorial estate, 100 kilometers away. There's an old Tibetan proverb. Life is given by one's parents, but one's body belongs to the rulers. One may have life, but never freedom. At the new manorial estate, Tsering Hamo befriended another serf Punsoklud. <laughs> ジャタンプナ、ゲタカンテビトタ。アニコツンガナリアユガタンシャチェツンガナ、ミシンダチェタルマジュチェ。ミシンダチェタルマジュビンゾンテコニムチツンニソトトトチュクトト。コタチン
Li Yo Yi, a former nationalist government official in Tibet, reported once asking some Tibetan serfs why they never rose up in rebellion against the exploitation and oppression. The surprising response was that they believed they committed a sin in their previous life. Therefore, they should suffer in this life in order to expurgate the evil they'd done and live happily in the next. It seems that the pre-existing Tibetan society was effectively a feudal theocracy dominated by landlords and lamas. C'est une théocratie ce qu'on appelle totalement. Une théocratie, c'est-à-dire euh, le pouvoir est à, est, à la, est à la religion. Un tel système d'oppression euh, faisait que les, les gens peut-être craignaient d'autant plus l'autorité euh, et des familles et de la religion et donc ne pouvaient pas aller euh, euh, se, se rebeller ou en tout cas exiger des droits. Euh, by the mid-1950s, the Chinese region of Tibet remained a society of feudal serfdom under theocratic rule. People continued to have their dignity trampled on by a social system that was backward, barbarous and cruel. It was a system that prevented any possibility of social progress. One day, in 1952, Norbud Tsering was forcibly separated from his father, Palatasha Wang Chu. Norbud Tsering's mother, Ladrong, was a serf at the Palamana, responsible for brewing wine. She was beautiful, and Tasha Wang Chu had fallen in love with her. But the Pala family was opposed to their relationship. Finally, after many years of resisting, Tasha Wang Chu was forced to marry the daughter of another noble family in Gyansi. And Ladron was married to the family's butler. As for Nobu Tsering, at the age of seven, he was stripped of his noble title. Scared and helpless, he and his mother were driven off the Pala estate. Decades later, Norbu Tsering, the sole heir of the Pala family, lives in a simple house in a village in Gyansi County, near his family's former estate. He earns a living from raising yaks. <laughs> Tolekan After being forced to leave home at the age of 12, Tering Yamo spent the next 20 years working at Wenchua Manor. The estate today is showing the signs of decades of neglect. 
Tsering Yamo is 90 years old and spending her retirement in Nodong County, Shannan Prefecture. She has four children, two boys and two girls. Migma Tsering is her grandson. Age 28, he's a local government official in Shannan Prefecture. Many young Tibetans like Nima Tsering are today enjoying a happy and fulfilling life, and the future looks even brighter. Yet they are aware of history and convinced it must never be forgotten. Every morning before breakfast, Dapa Dawa says his prayers. This has been his routine for many years, and the worsening pain in his leg hasn't stopped him. The 76-year-old monk has spent almost seven decades at Tashi Lumpur Monastery. Tasha Lumpur is the biggest monastery in Tibet. Built in 1447, its name means all fortune and happiness gathered here. Dapa Dawa was the eight-year-old son of a serf when he first arrived at Tasha Lumpur Monastery in 1948. He came from Khatse County, where he'd been performing backbreaking labor for the local estate owner. He turned to the monastery in the belief that he would at least be given food there. One by one, his friends fled the monastery. Early one morning, he also tried to run away. But as a frightened eight-year-old, he couldn't find his way home. He was caught, returned to the monastery, and subjected to a severe beating as punishment. Prior to 1959, the authorities in Tibet stipulated that every family with three sons or more must send one of them to a monastery to perform korvi, unpaid labor. These korvi monks, of whom the vast majority came from serf families, were not permitted to practice Buddhism. Nedu Damagada, Totomwa, 
According to official statistics, in 1959 there were 114,925 Buddhist monks in Tibet, accounting for a quarter of the entire male population. This was far higher than the proportion of the clergy in the countries of medieval Europe. Since the monks were effectively removed from the labor force and from procreation, Tibet's productivity and birth rate were in long-term decline. Even inside the monasteries, a clear hierarchy existed, with the monks divided into higher and lower classes. Dapadawa found life in the monastery little different from his experience as a serf. Russian scholar Gombujab Tsibikov, after visiting Tibet, wrote, Tibet's religious leaders formed a powerful elite that controlled all aspects of life. And yet, inside a monastery, the ordinary monks lived in a state of constant fear, subjected to ruthless punishment and, in extreme cases, even the death penalty. Some of Tibet's monasteries even had their own private jails, equipped with wrist and leg irons and instruments of torture. Tibet's theocratic form of government severely tarnished Buddhism. Monasteries were no longer places for serving and praying to the Buddha. Instead, in the guise of organizing religious activities, the monasteries plundered resources, ran armed bands, and operated kangaroo courts. In a letter, a Tibetan government official detailed what was required for a particular Buddhist ceremony. He wrote, a corpus of fresh intestines, two skulls, some mixed blood, and a whole human skin are urgently needed. Please have these delivered without delay. Monasteries were even expected to offer donations for celebrating the birthday of the Dalai Lama. In the early years of the 20th century, Daily Mail journalist Edmund Candler accompanied a British military expedition to Lhasa. He recorded his experiences in a book, The Unveiling of Lhasa. Candler wrote, But at present, people are medieval, not only in their system of government and their religion, their inquisition, their witchcraft, their incarnations, their ordeals by fire and boiling oil, but in every aspect of their daily life. He went on, I question if ever in the history of the world there has been another occasion when bigotry and darkness have been exposed with such abruptness to the inroad of science. Before its peaceful liberation in 1951, Tibet didn't have a single school with a modern curriculum. Illiteracy among the young and middle-aged was at 95%. There were no proper hospitals, and for most Tibetans, the only hope of curing illness lay in prayer. Average life expectancy was 35 and a half years. Without highways or decent roads, mail and supplies had to be delivered on people's backs or in yak carts. Canadian Tibetologist A. Tom Grunfeld has refuted claims that milk, tea, meat and vegetables were available in abundance in Tibet before 1959. According to an investigation in 1940, only about 38% of families in eastern Tibet had ever tasted milk tea. And 75% of families said they survived by eating wild herbs boiled together with highland barley flour and yak bones. As Grunfeld wrote, there is no evidence to support the image of a utopian Shangri-La.
The personal accounts of those living at the time support this view. Former senior Tibetan official Nabu Nawang Jingmei once wrote, In the 1940s, I often discussed with my friends the crisis in Tibetan society. We all agreed that the old system would come to a natural end. Before long, all the serfs would be dead, and so would the nobles. The whole society would collapse. 封建农奴制度，特别是到了这个二十世纪五十年代，它真是成了一种西藏社会的最大的阻碍力。如果不把它推翻，西藏的一切进步都无从谈起。Ça soulève des questions. Comment on a pu laisser à un endroit sur la planète, à ce moment-là, un tel système In the early spring of 1959, four-year-old Dechen Droma still had two more years of Korvi labor to complete. 33-year-old Tsering Yamo, wearing her mother's leather coat, continued the struggle for survival. Twenty-eight-year-old Tabsang was continuing the struggle to avoid becoming a slave. Fourteen-year-old Nordbu Tsering was spending his seventh year away from his father. A 19-year-old monk, Dapadawa, was still overwhelmed with work at the monastery. <laughs> 